posted on our YouTube channel. So we assume that your, uh, your presence here is consent, that you're fine with being, uh, being recorded. And we welcome you to join us in the chat. We have some excellent, excellent folks that are going to be sharing their expertise today. And we welcome you to share any questions that you have in the chat or resources, or even just to introduce yourself and share what's happening in your world. Um, because we know everyone has some similar pieces with this uh, moving to remote learning. And then there's some things that are very unique as well. Um, I'm going to dive right into some introductions and getting uh, everyone going because we have some great prompts and some great information to share. And I'm checking real quick to see if we have one more um, panelist joining us and he'll probably be here shortly. I'm Rachel Mann. I am your moderator for today. I'm based out of Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm the director of member engagement for NCLA. And I'm joined with some awesome, awesome panelists, as I mentioned before. And I'm gonna start off by introducing Daniel Wally, who is the academic director for Pathfinder, which is in Mass Palmer, Massachusetts. Uh, and it's the Regional Vocational Technical High School. He's been in education for 11 years and mostly in turnaround districts and communities with high poverty rates. Dan, can you start off with sharing what's happening in your context in Palmer? Uh, sure. Um, first off, thanks for having me. Uh, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to come here and share with everybody. Uh, so being a vocational technical high school, uh, we thought the only mode and method that would make sense during this time is a hybrid model for learning. So what we have done is we created a plan to have all of our students in their technical areas are going to be in the building with us um, because we are a technical high school. So there's the reason that students wanted to come to Pathfinder in the first place is for vocational ed. So we thought the only thing that made sense was having the students in their technical areas um, as long as it was safe to do so. So we crafted a plan to make sure that it was safe for our students to enter the building. And we also thought that having our ninth and 10th grade students uh, coming in for academics was pertinent as well. Um, we thought those beginning years in high school are very, very important, especially being in Massachusetts. Those are our tested grades. Unfortunately, that's you know, a big factor for getting our students prepared is uh, you know, state testing and MCAS. So we have a week about system so our ninth and 10th grade students are on opposite weeks. So those students will be phased in for academics as well. So what that naturally did was kind of kept our numbers down. So we were able to have the students in uh, safely and spaced out in classrooms um, with that model that we kind of created. And for the first two weeks of school, we're actually only having our freshmen in person. Uh, again, we really need to kind of grasp those freshmen. They realize that they're coming to Pathfinder for a reason. We need to make sure that they're here and comfortable in this environment. Um, so it was very important for us to kind of build those relationships with those students first. So our um, academics are remote at this time, but the students are here uh, in ninth grade in a mini exploratory, we're calling it. So they're kind of cycling through eight of our vocational technical programs and uh, kind of getting a lay of the land like they would have later on in the year. But again, we thought it was very important to get them in as soon as we could, get them comfortable, get them seeing kind of what we're all about here in a vocational technical setting. And so far it's working out very well. Our students are here, they're happy. It's uh, wonderful to actually see students in the building. It's the first time since March. Uh, you know, you kind of realize why you got into this business, you know, when you see those kids coming back you realize that you've missed them for the past six months or so. And uh, it was nice to have them here. They kind of energize our staff and us and um, things are going very well so far. And that's kind of the model that we've, that we've been uh, going with so far. Oh, well, thank you, Dan. And it really, truly, as we, uh, we realize how much we've taken for granted <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure those students are so excited to be able to be there in person. And next, I'm going to introduce Dr. Aaron Smith. And I want to mention that when you go to the YouTube recording of this webinar, you're going to see a more extended bio for each of our panelists because they are doing some amazing work. And I want to make sure you get to know more about them. But I'm going to briefly introduce Dr. Smith. He is the CEO of Workplace Readiness Solutions in Chesapeake, Virginia. And he just had a book released this month called Blank Check 
what if you were asked to help to reinvent public schools, which is a very timely subject. So I'm looking forward to ordering this and digging into it. Uh, Aaron, what is the current learning landscape in Virginia? Uh, the current landscape in Virginia, it depends on the locality. Some schools districts are actually having a hybrid model where some of the students are coming in where they're focusing on special needs, English language, they're coming in. You have some districts that are completely uh, uh, distance for the first marking period. So they're doing a close analysis almost week by week to see where everything is. So it's one of those things where right now the school district I'm in is completely hybrid, but we have, uh, excuse me, completely virtual. We have a hybrid model already set up in contingency so that when the light is turned on, we've got to go ahead to do that. All right, thank you for that, Aaron. And uh, we have uh, Ernie Poole, who is the Superintendent Director for Assabet Valley Regional Vocational School District. He is also in Massachusetts, but he's in Marlboro. And Ernie started his CTE journey as a vocational student in high school, which of course made me very excited. That's where I started my CTE journey as well. He was in a metal and fabrication and welding program, which really gives him a unique perspective to bring to his role as a superintendent director. He is currently working on his doctorate degree in transformational leadership. Ernie, what is the current learning landscape there in Marlboro? Sure. Thank you, Rachel. And I uh, appreciate you having me on as a panelists to join my other colleagues. Um, so in Marlboro, uh, very similar to what uh, Dan had spoken about out in Palmer, um, Asavit has engaged in a, what we call a hybrid 50 model in which 50% of our students are going to be in the building at one time. Uh, similar to what Dan mentioned, we have our 10th and 12th graders that are together during one format and then generally the 9th and 11th graders are opposite uh, and they're in academics that week. So uh, we felt it was very important for our students who choose to come to a vocational technical education um, to have that hands-on component. It's not something that can be easily replicated in a remote learning setting. Uh, so therefore, we basically built our plan uh, to make sure we exercise that uh, opportunity to the best of our ability. So uh, our students come in. Uh, one of the little bit of a change that we have we've done with uh, our students is that one period a day uh, during that vocational uh, week, they do get pulled out for an academic classroom. So they do get to see their academic teachers face to face uh, to be able to touch base and check in. Um, but the majority of the time in, uh, for academics was remote <laughs> learning. So I think uh, for us, you know, some of my uh, sending districts that uh, are not uh, regional vocationals, but are just comprehensive academic districts. Some just started this week, actually today. Um, we've been open with a slow kind of phase in with our freshman students uh, last week, Tuesday through Friday. Uh, so they were able to do a mini exploratory that we were able to complete in the four days. Uh, they saw all 17 programs. They had about an hour and a half in each, um, as well as some other activities to acclimate to the building and to the new protocols around COVID-19. So that's where we're at. Oh, that, that is such an exciting way to them into the program. Uh, we also have Kulsum Vicaria, who is an instructional coach. She works for Ed Connective, and she's based out of Irvine, California. She's been in education for 11 years, with the last four of those being in the role of an instructional coach. And she has extensive experience with this whole virtual side of it. So welcome, Kulsum. If you would share with us a little bit about what's happening in your world in California. Um, sure. Well, I can talk about with Ed Connective, we really support teachers um, in a lot of different states. We have people in Michigan, Maryland, Virginia, everywhere. Um, and so we've been really adapting to the different needs of different school districts. So a lot of our time we spend working with teachers and have been giving workshops to teachers about what it looks like to be remote, what it looks like to be hybrid, and for a few teachers, what it looks like to be completely in person. So we've been... Um, really thinking about that, especially through a CTE lens for a lot of schools um, and thinking about if you are in remote learning, what does that look like? What are the unique challenges um, to that? And what are some possible workarounds if you have no way of going back in the building? So we've been kind of wearing all of our hats this summer. 
Fantastic. And I, I, Will Morris, who is the founder of Ed Connective, he has been on our, you may remember him from being on the webinar before, for those of you who've been attending our series since, uh, since we first started in March, um, but they're doing some great work in this and uh, have been have been doing this for a long time prior to COVID-19. So uh, definitely check out their website and their organization. All right, and finally, we have my dear friend, Susan Leon. She is a CTE at Curriculum and Instructional Specialist for Westmec in Phoenix, Arizona. We've known each other for years and had the opportunity to work together at Westmec and continue to work together through our role with ACTE on the new and related services division. So welcome, Susan. Can you share with us what's happening at Westmec or in Arizona in general? Thanks, Rachel. Um, first of all, thank you all for um, coming to this panel. I'm honored to be with these colleagues I just met, but it's a, it's a nice panel to be on. So I do know Rachel from Westmac during her time here. Uh, we are a uh, career and technical education school district over the West Valley of the Phoenix area. We serve Oh, about oh, 48 high schools over 13 school districts. So our format's a little different. Our students go to their home high school to do their core classes and any other electives. And then they'll come to us um, for their CTE class either in the morning or afternoon. So I think as you guys know, if you've kind of watched the news, and Arizona's a little on the back end of the pandemic as compared to like the East Coast and what's going on over there. So we've been, um, Schools over here have just not been opening. I don't, I don't, unfortunately don't know of a school district that open on time or day one, what we do over in Arizona in August. Um, we are slowly starting to open back up and we're seeing some of those school districts open back up. I know um, a few of our, our partner school districts opened this week or opening in the middle of the month, next month. So our students really haven't been in school since March. At Westmec, what we did is we've been doing virtual learning since the beginning of August. However, we opened back up for full in-person learning about a week and a half ago. So our students have been back doing that. I know we have some other questions, so I, we can talk about the implementation of what we've been doing at Westmec with that piece. So that's been going on with us. Again, right now I'm serving as an instructional coach, just like my colleague on the panel. So um, I've been coaching through virtual learning these this past month and a half, and now we're really talking about transitional items and having all the students back on campus. All right, and thanks so much, Susan. And Dan, can you share with us what were the biggest obstacles when moving to re a remote environment? And how did you and your district navigate these obstacles? And we'll start with you, and then uh, Ernie can jump in, and we'll have each of the panelists share out. Sure. So I think one of the biggest obstacles that we had was just the general unfamiliarity, especially for our uh, vocational teachers uh, moving to an online platform. It's very, very different trying to teach carpentry or HVAC um, in a remote setting versus being in person. Uh, so trying to combat that and get our teachers more familiar with using digital platforms, even just using uh, Google Classroom and Zooms and things like that was interesting. So kind of what we did was we did a lot of homegrown PD. Uh, we had a lot of our teachers that are in the building that had more familiarity with those types of things doing professional development sessions uh, for our own people in house. Uh, we have a lot of expertise in the building and everybody kind of has a hand in doing different things. So kind of keeping things here in house was very, very helpful for our teachers and um, Having a teaming aspect as well, uh, even within the departments themselves, uh, you always have some people that are better at things than others and learning from each other. Um, but really it was just about trying to replicate a hands-on experience uh, virtually and doing things like screencasting lessons and uh, sending kits home for students where they can do little projects that they can follow along with the teachers was kind of a big help. Um, and then another big obstacle was accountability. Uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, um, there wasn't a whole lot of accountability uh, in Massachusetts for things like attendance and, uh, you know, grading everything was a bit of a wash in the beginning, uh, you know, based on state guidance and everything like that. So really right now, getting our students back in the swing of things and ramping up the accountability for our students just being in class on time when they haven't done that since March of last year 
um, has been a bit of a struggle. So really making sure that we ramp up the uh, communication with parents and families, making sure we're ramping up the communication with the students themselves, and uh, making sure that they know that the expectations of a typical school day are actually here, even though they might not be in front of us physically. Uh, so a lot of it has to do with really just getting used to being online, you know, for the teachers and for the students. And um, I think that's why it's a really big help being in a hybrid model, because at least most of the time that they're in their vocational technical areas, the students are actually going to be in house. So they'll have some face to face time, you know, and, you know, it's good for the teachers too. They need that face to face time as well. So really trying to make it so that everybody's getting used to it and figuring out the resources to use that are going to be best for them and the kids. So um, I, just to piggyback, I think, you know, one of the uh, outstanding aspects of career and technical education, I think, you know, in Massachusetts and throughout the country is that we have a, uh, there's a uh, togetherness uh, that, you know, we're all in this together type of a mentality. Uh, we have great networking opportunities. I see we have our executive director from MAVA, Kevin Faron, and our uh, 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 assistant executive director, Peter Dewar, as well as as many colleagues from Massachusetts. And one of the things that I can tell you is that this community came together uh, in an instant in March when all of a sudden we had to be, we were thrust into the, you know, the remote uh, atmosphere when it came to CTE learning. Uh, you know, our academic teachers, of course, through just natural progression and they're used to say Google Classroom and other uh, modes uh, or vehicles uh, for remote learning had a little bit of an upper hand, but the vocational community uh, for some of our folks that had some difficulty, I think, um, grasping that, you know, we had some internal, what we call like super users or technical teacher, uh, teachers, technical side and academic side actually, uh, that assisted with our vocational teachers and helping them get up and running. But I think MAVA as a whole, uh, with some leadership of some of our superintendents like in Aaron Polanski, who I know is on the call as well. And I know you know Aaron well, because he, he likes to do songs on these podcasts. Um, but uh, he, uh, oh, he's getting his, getting his guitar out. Yeah, I'm afraid to see what he's going to look at. I know this is not a comedy era, Aaron. Uh, but, you know, so through leadership like that, you know, folks were able to share best practices and, and actually utilize. I think the, the one thing, you know, as a vocational student myself, that we're great at is making things relevant. So regardless if it's remote or, you know, or in person, uh, our teachers have that mindset to say, okay, I've got to think of some type of a carpentry related theory lesson in which I need to have the kids figure out, you know, room, you know, uh, square footage of a, of a space um, I'll have them measure the rooms in their house to get some practice. So that's kind of what they did, you know, as one of their lessons to, to do that. And uh, I think some of the same obstacles that Dan shared, you know, with some of the platforms our folks getting used to, um, some of the bandwidth issues that we had was that we do not have a, we were not a one-to-one -one type school when it comes to mobile devices. Uh, so some of the uh, obstacles related on, uh, dependent upon the equipment, uh, that was lacking from our students. Um, most of our teachers are equipped, but we had to get that equipment out to students. So that's kind of some of the challenges we faced. I can add to that too and say, you know, we, we thought about things a lot from that exact student perspective that Ernie just mentioned. Um, just like Dan said that there were teachers who were ready to go into online learning and there were teachers who struggled with it. We found that that same difference exists with students. And so a lot of my support to teachers has been thinking about what are your students access capabilities? How quickly can they get on the internet? If you ask them to watch a YouTube demonstration and then write a reflection on it, how quickly can they do that? Do they know how to do it? And do they know how to submit that assignment? Um, so really, our biggest obstacle has been kind of inventorying students access and thinking about um, for each teacher, what is your particular student body's needs? And how can you um, change your teaching and adjust your teaching style to match what their access is? And so that's kind of been the biggest thing to navigate because it's so different for every student, even within a classroom. Um, so it requires a lot of flexibility on the part of the teacher. So I think one of the big struggles we had coming back in August was student engagement. They are were tired of virtual learning. 
um, since they've been doing it since March. They, you know, as much as we want like human interaction, they're teenagers, they live off that. So it was hard for them not to be around peers for that long. So the struggle with just keeping the engagement and the excitement going at the 1st of August with the carrot that you guys were gonna come back as soon as we can. Um, what was a struggle for the teachers? I think uh, going along with what the other panelists said, some of those high engagement activities that got them excited. Um, so for example, I work with our cosmetology teachers and one of our hairstyling uh, campuses, programs at the campus did a hair show. So the students got to pick a family member or themselves and it was surrounding a theme. And then they had shared Google slides where they produced um, a product either on themselves or a lot of them did younger siblings and posted those pictures around that theme on, a, on Google Slides where it was collaborative and then they all got to vote. And that those activities and things like that kept the students engaged knowing that they were gonna come back soon. The tech was always an issue that you guys have noted. Um, I think with the teachers, we've got teachers all across the board. Um, what we have most at West Neck is teachers that come from industry. So our teachers that come from industry from co our coding and IT security programs thrive in an environment like this, where some of our teachers in our mechatronics program or hairstyling program might not have as much um, experience with Google Classroom. So we really played up the collaboration between programs. We had almost weekly or bi-weekly meetings online with our programs and where we've struggled before with collaboration, I think this environment actually kind of made it happen because we, the teachers didn't have enough time to adjust all of their lessons, but if they collaborated together, it really benefited them in the long run. So that's a positive thing I think that came out of this. Um, the student uh, tech, we had a, because we serve so many districts over here in the West Valley, there were a few districts that were not one-to-one -one and they were not giving out devices. So a few of our campuses gave out uh, close to 100 devices to the students and then troubleshooting that. I'm sure you guys have experienced troubleshooting distance is it, it's almost impossible <laughs> to try to figure out what the student's seeing and you're trying to troubleshoot the software or the hardware. It's difficult. So that piece. Um, and then I think one of the other big things that I wrote down is communication. So we're kind of seeing right now because our students came back in person some places some teachers have maybe dropped the ball with parent communication or student communication and we're trying to get that back ramped up and trying to really um, collaborate with the, the admin and the parents and the teachers and get back on track with that. There was just so much going on, it's understandable, but you guys know that we can't ever let communication lie with our parents. So um, we're trying to get back on track with that, with everything that's going on. I, I really agree with everybody um, so far. And I think the two things that have made me more aware is number one is the importance of the digital divide between those that are fluent and those that are not affluent. And just because a, a student is getting a device, that still doesn't mean that they understand how to use it to their advantage. And part of that means that we have to train parents and make it in a way that's encouraging and welcoming for them to feel like that. This is something that's normal. This is something that's going to be very beneficial for the kids, but at the same time, patience with the children that are adjusting to it. Because you can imagine some of us as educators are having tech issues, bandwidth issues. It's only trifold um, when you think about it at home because sometimes they just don't know that the password needs to be reset, something as simple as that. The other thing that I noticed is it, it kind of follows with what Susan said, um, engagement. I think the importance of powerful and laser focused feedback is critical because when we talk about competencies in the CTE world, it's one of those things that we take a lot of pride in. And especially when you deal with industrial professionals who are coming into the teacher uh, as a teacher and they're talking with students in the classroom, there's that rapport that is so special and it bonds. And when you give feedback over the computer, sometimes it's not the same as being in person. So you want to make sure you're very articulate, you're very encouraging, and you want to make sure that that relationship continues to grow just as if it was in the classroom. 
Excellent. Thank, thanks so much to each of you for sharing some very unique perspectives that I hadn't even thought of for approaching uh, this whole move to remote learning. And I know that as a CTE leader, there's additional things that you have to take into consideration. So looking at it from that leadership lens, um, what are some issues that you face when planning for remote learning environments? And Ernie, if we can start off with you for this one. Sure. Um, you know, one of the things like I mentioned was I think the major need for professional development for our staff. Um, you know, it's it's a complex a complexity that I think um, comes into play, you know, our remote learning for our academic folks. Again, they have a little bit of a step up. They do more with technology, you know, from the stand of digital technology. We have some programs obviously design a visual computer programming and web, a business technology type program. Obviously, they're on technology all day. They would have a little bit, a um, little bit more ease of use uh, when it comes to that. But our traditional hard trade areas, carpentry, electrical, plumbing, um, those folks needed to have some additional help. So, you know, some additional professional development for those folks um, to be able to um, deliver. And I would say, you know, although the majority of our kids are in-person learning right now for their career and technical component. Uh, we do have a number of students that are uh, selected to be completely remote. So our technical teachers are on the hook now to be able to provide in-person and uh, remote learning uh, lessons uh, for those students that chose to be completely 100% remote. So we went and purchased uh, kind of a TV stand set up with a uh, camera, webcam, and that has the flexibility of a laptop so they can have that right in their career tech program so as they're doing a lesson it serves two purposes one to provide a larger screen so the students can maintain their six foot distancing social distancing while in person in the shop but on the second uh, piece of that they can also potentially zoom um, to the remote learning student that's at home watching that same lesson and or potentially record it as we're recording this uh, uh, podcast that, uh, you know, so that way they have it in a library that they can assign to a student maybe at a later, later uh, point in time. We did, uh, as many did, you know, we kind of scrambled to go with a, we, folks got on Zoom, they looked at GoToMeeting, right? They went with Google Classroom. We happen to be a Google uh, Classroom type uh, school district. So we actually narrowed our uh, focus back to Google Meet. Um, number one, I think it helped reduce some of the potential Zoom bombing issues that folks were experiencing. Um, and it was a single platform, so teachers didn't have to feel that they needed to understand multiple platforms, and they could get really uh, become educated and get experience at one uh, major platform. Form. And they've used it for other activities, maybe not to the extent as, like I said, the academic folks, uh, but really professional development, getting the kids on one platform that's associated with our student uh, learning system. Um, I think that helped prepare us, our teachers uh, to be in a much better place uh, to get this school year started than when we kind of got pushed into it back in March. Um, yeah, I would, I would add to that, um, thinking one big obstacle is really particular to CTE is sort of thinking about what Aaron said about the digital divide also really applies to kind of an equipment divide. Um, so for example, I was working with a culinary teacher who, um, you know, asked her students to do an assignment and there were she had a diverse group of students and there was a set of students who had no problem getting the ingredients and ha having them do this over the spring, but another group of students who couldn't manage to get those ingredients. And so really thinking through equity and like, and how do different students have access to the materials that are sometimes so necessary for CTE education. Um, so, you know, with the instance of that teacher, it really boiled down to getting additional funding for particular students to have kits dropped off to their home that had materials for certain um, assignments that they were due at home. So it was really thinking about this and how do we bridge that gap for certain students for and when we don't have to for another group. So I think that's a particular um, challenge for CTE education. Um, the two things that kind of come to mind when I think about this question is our professional development and then like the hands-on learning piece. So 
the professional development, at least in our district, we have an entire professional development department that focuses on providing um, quality PDs to anybody in the state can take them. We focus on our internal teachers and um, our member districts, but anybody in the state could take them. We, our PD department is fantastic in really adjusting to the environment. We have typically in the past done all day PDs where they get a substitute and they come for eight hours. Instead, we've done little hour tech seminars from like hours of nine to 10 or 10 to 11. Those all day ones that are eight hours, they've adjusted to four two hour blocks every day when our member districts and teachers typically don't have students. So that's worked out really well. Um, and in a virtual environment, uh, some more, more people can go than getting a sub in their district and taking a whole day off. So that has been a really good adjustment, I think, for professional development. Um, the other thing is hands-on. So when you asked me this question <laughs> with the transition, like basically our department, I'm in the curriculum instruction department, sat down in July and broke down the CTE delivery model and we kind of took champions for each one to break those pieces down. The hands-on piece was something I don't think we ever really got clear on until the students came back. And for all of the reasons my fellow panelists have already expressed, the equity issues, the, um, we wouldn't want them to do hands-on in precision machining or working on a car or cutting somebody's hair without the proper guidance um, or tools that they don't have at home. So we really preloaded when we were doing virtual learning with the theory, with social emotional learning, with professionalism skills learning. And then also we did a lot in our programs with the certification bodies that provided virtual certifications, either like low level or moderate level certifications. We really focused on those in August and September. So OSHA 10, um, some of those lower level COVID-19 certifications that some of our human services or medical program um, certification bodies were offering. But I will admit, I don't think we ever really got a good grasp on the, the hands-on piece without the students actually here and with the equipment that they needed. I, I agree with you, Susan, because to me, when you're in a CTE course, the, the caveat is the certifications and the, the time spent earning that particular job apprenticeship, if you will. And that's something I think we're all trying to figure out right now. Some solutions can be as easy as, as finding a courseware that's almost the same thing as being in class. I think it's gonna force teachers to rethink and redevelop opportunities that could become virtual or more so gamified so that it allows them to become distant learning just as much as they're in class learning. You know, I think we are, we are all bound by our imagination and we have to stay focused on trying to drive instruction to that next level of learning, which taps into the learning styles while resonating into a way of making sure that it ties in with the competencies and the passing of the certification. So to, to hop in, one of the things that wasn't really mentioned was um, we're talking about issues as CTE leaders when, when going remote. One thing that we didn't talk about is it's really hard for us as administrators to support teachers remotely too sometimes. Um, so not only are our teachers trying to teach our students remotely too, but then we as administrators have to try to provide support to our teachers as best we can virtually as well if we're not in the building and not with them. Uh, so again, improving communication is one of those things that is very, very pertinent when trying to handle a, a situation like this. And not only that, it's trying to plan for every little contingency that might happen uh, when going to a remote setting. There's a lot of different things that might happen. So it's very, very difficult to make a plan that is going to um, you know, benefit everybody at every point in time. So trying to do our best to create a plan that affects the masses and is going to work for everybody. Um, you know, so we have to have our students that are on IEPs come into the building, give them that option. So when we give those students that option, uh, that creates logistical issues because uh, those students have to be with staff. They have to be somewhere physically in the building that you might have not have been preparing for in your original plan. Uh, so there's just all these different things in these different scenarios that you have to try to plan for as a leader. 
and not only that, providing support uh, for your people, um, especially those that might not be used to delivering content in this way. So you're almost providing tech support as well as academic support, um, you know, as well as just content support. And it adds a little bit of a load to, to us as leaders too. And, you know, trying to do the best that we can to make it so that everybody's successful is, is difficult at this time. It's a, it's a huge job. <laughs> I can't, can't even imagine. And I'm, I'm going to combine the next two questions because they have some similar components. But for those of you who have gone back to in-person instruction, what has that transition looked like? And also, are you continuing to plan for a scenario of returning to remote and distance learning or hybrid models, um, having those plans 10, 11, 12, <laughs> as, as we're thinking about this future? And um, Kalsum, if you can start with us for this one. Yeah, sure. So um, for teachers that I've seen that have gone to in-person learning, it, of course, looks very different than it ever did. Um, and I think especially in terms of something teachers have to navigate is student collaboration, like how much do you have students working together on something? Um, and teachers have had to be very creative, right? So just in setting up stations so that only a limited number of students are at each station, or I've had a teacher who's had done like gallery walks where as students are working on something, they leave post-it notes right at the station giving their, their peers feedback because it's not easy to kind of get close and chat and have that um, communication. So I think a lot of what we've been seeing is how do teachers navigate students working together um, when they are in person and how do they really get them to still feel like they're building relationships with their classmates and working together with their classmates when they have to stay six feet apart and stay masked, et cetera. Um, and so that's definitely something we've been thinking about. As far as preparing, um, I think we are preparing kind of for all things. Uh, I've a lot of people who are going back in person, just like Ernest mentioned, are still videotaping and still having students do a lot of their work and submissions um, like through video or through um, some sort of online format so that if some sort of transition needs to be made, it should be um, less, less uh, tumultuous than it was in the spring when that transition needed to be made. So I think everyone's kind of operating like one foot out the door in case they need to be, right? So uh, this is an interesting question for me because our students have been back for a week and a half right now. Um, so I would say it's kind of twofold. What I'm thinking of is logistically when our, our students came back, how does that look? What we've been doing, um, I think all every department has had to really uh, grab a hold of what logistically that looks like. Our IT department, us, curriculum and instruction department, um, our administration teams on each campus have really felt the brunt of logistically what is our, what do the students getting back on campus, so what does it look like? Um, they've been doing a couple of things, but a lot is staggered start times um, for every program, so the students are coming on differently on the campus at different times. I know one of our campuses, the students have to wait in their car until they see their teacher at the door then they have to mask up and they go straight to that door. Unfortunately, they don't get to take breaks in our break areas with our nice snack machines. They just have to stay in their class. They need to bring their own food. Um, I know on other campuses, your masks need to be on the second you leave your car all the way to the classroom. What we are really encouraging uh, as district leadership and with our teachers is we really rely on our teachers to be the industry experts because most of our teachers come from industry and then the teaching aspect is new to them. We are really relying on them to know what's going on in their industries right now and what those protocols are and that we're trying to mirror that. So um, I work with our esthetician department and if anybody knows what esthetician is, you're really close to each other's faces. So we've had to really wrap our brains around how does that look? So we're really following what industry is doing right now, which is the client, but we're, we're not taking models right now. We're not taking anybody on our campuses from off campus, but the student that's acting as the client does take their mask off and they are laying on the table for a certain amount of time. And then the esthetician is wearing a mask and a face shield. We're not using blankets. We're not using steam machines. Um, we're not using any kind of fans that move any air around. So we're just recreating what's happening in industry right now. 
I think the second piece of that is curriculum. Since our students haven't been here since March, it's almost, I don't want to say our curriculum stopped, but the hands-on almost stopped. So really assessing where our students are when they came back. We, at West Mac, we, most of our students are in a two-year program, their junior and senior year. Most of our programs are two years. So we do a pre and a post test for our first year students to assess learning. Um, what we did in August was have our year one and year two kids all take the pre test. So we had some data for our teachers to say, hey, here's where your students are at. And it really, I think, opened especially the second year teachers' eyes um, as to where the gaps in learning were. So it's almost as if they have to go back and reteach some theory um, with the practical piece in mind that they missed almost since March. So we have some great scope and sequences we've really developed in our district, but um, I don't want to use this terminology, but it's all, they're almost blown up right now because we're just kind of trying to jigsaw pieces together and, and meet our students where they're at. And the way I see this is a lot of school districts across the nation, they, they basically are preparing two game plans, if you will. One is the in-person, if you will, while you're also preparing the distance learning. So you, you've captured that through the same module. And that's going to look very differently from class to class, much less district to district. For me, what I think we also need to focus in on is how are we making sure kids learn, whether they're in the classroom, whether they're at the distance learning. And we need to plant seeds of autonomous learning. And this is one of the big skills that are needed in the workplace today is how do we have kids who want to learn the material, to own the material, who want to come to school excited about it. And as we are refining and adjusting our curriculums, I think we also have to keep that at our forefront as making sure that, you know, there's not going to be a disconnect, if you will, between the kids who love being at school and doing a great job with the hands-on stuff and those that are not doing well at home, uh, catching up on a little research, a little note-taking, if you want, things like that. You know, it has to go side by side. Yeah, so a lot of the things that we did at Pathfinder, I'm sure Ernie is going to have a lot of the same things to uh, talk about. We're at very similar schools, so sorry to step on your toes, Ernie. Um, so a lot of the things that we did, especially um, in the vocational areas, is talking about space. Uh, we had to make sure that students were spaced apart appropriately, uh, both in their academic classrooms for those students that will be coming back and getting phased in, but also in their technical areas. So even in things like advanced machine, uh, making sure that the machines that the students are working on, making sure those lathes are actually six feet apart. Uh, so we actually had to do a lot of physical uh, layout changes in you know, the academic areas and in the vocational areas. Uh, making sure that students aren't sharing tools as much as possible. Uh, if they do have to share tools, making sure that we're sanitizing it in between, you know, different students grabbing different pieces of equipment. Um, lunch and breakfast protocols, making sure that the students had places to go because it's very hard to wear a mask and eat. So we had to make sure that the students were at least six feet apart. Um, so we had to set up alternative areas for our students to eat lunch. Uh, we had to use part of our gymnasium and uh, set it up as like a second cafeteria, um, having our students eat in the vocational technical areas where it is safe to do so. Um, you know, making sure that they're not near any chemicals or anything like that for those students that will be eating. Um, and making sure that our procedures for new work and construction and things like that for the students that go off site, uh, there's only new construction. They're not going into any other um, residential households or anything like that for the students that go off campus. Uh, so there was just a lot that goes into um, spacing and logistics because uh, not only do you have to worry about space, but that means you have to worry about scheduling. Uh, when you're worried about having a certain number of kids in a space at one time, that changes how many kids you can have in a classroom. Uh, so that makes it a nightmare for scheduling purposes too, which is probably one of the biggest hurdles to overcome because uh, we only have for academic classrooms here at Pathfinder, we only have four or five classrooms that you can fit more than 20 kids in while being spaced out. And, uh, you know, so that creates a lot of challenges in terms of just creating a master schedule that's going to work for the year. Uh, so there was a lot that goes into it. And to go on to the next question, um, it's, 
it's something that you always plan for. We're always planning for that day that the governor shuts it down again and uh, we have to go fully remote. So what we did was we kind of front loaded all of our professional development to focus on distance learning, even for our vocational teachers, just in case, you know, that shutdown does happen. We're hoping that it doesn't. Again, we're hoping that the hybrid model is gonna work for our students because we want those students being here for their vocational learning. That's what they came to Pathfinder for. That's what we do. Um, but just in case, just in case it does happen, we had to prepare for that. So again, it's preparing for all those little contingencies that, that might happen. Sorry, I missed the mute button. Uh, yeah, so a lot of the things that Dan mentioned, same thing, same aspects that based ass of it. Um, I will say, you know, we have a, a bunch of rock stars in our staff and faculty that have rose to the occasion. I think, um, you know, some of the planning uh, logistical type situations thinking about too is, uh, which Dan didn't mention, but it's, you know, we're also trying to keep our kids in smaller cohorts. So if they are going to be working together, they're working in those smaller cohorts. As I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, session that uh, we're pulling our students one period a day to go and do an academic class. So we have a cohort of about 90 kids that are in that cohort. No larger, um, the groups are no larger than 15, 18 in size, uh, that they'll actually be within that 90 student cohort. But that whole cohort goes to lunch at the same time. Uh, they're from the same, career and technical programs each time that they leave to go to their academic uh, area. So um, yeah, it's been a, a challenge. And I think in, in Mass, just to give you a flavor for Massachusetts, uh, we had to create three hybrid, pro, uh, three, excuse me, uh, three plans, uh, an in-person, a hybrid, and a 100% remote. I know for Asabit, we did three different hybrid type programs that we looked at um, just to see what would best fit our needs. Uh, and I think the, the most important factor that probably all of us had looked at is what's in the best interest of our students and how are they going to best be able to learn, whether it be in person or remote. Uh, so I think, um, you know, that was our primary, primary focus. You know, we had very little, I had 96% of our students and parents wanted to come back in person or a hybrid. Um, so that just goes to show you that this type of education is engaging, it's relevant. It's the relationships that Aaron mentioned about that are, you know, uh, created, um, you know, just by the networking that happens here. I think the logistical piece is the thing that the, the teachers needed most help with and that they had to re-envision what the learning environment was going to look like. You know, typically, as, as was mentioned from the panelists, that, uh, you know, kids collaborate and we're all about, you know, teamwork and collaboration and getting groups together to brainstorm and do some critical thinking. But you know, uh, you you assign two students to say um, either in a welding booth because you have li limited equipment, or you assign them to, you know, if they were in automotive working on an engine component. Well, you can no longer have the two kids working on that engine component because, you know, the vehicle is not six feet wide. So you know, you've got now with one at the front of the car and one at the back of the car. So you know, it's a little bit. Um, larger perspective that you have to take a look at and I think once we all go back to our normal school year this is going to it's going to feel like a part-time job because we've you you just literally 24 7 you know your your thinking cap is on to be ready for the next possible change um, challenge obstacle uh, shoot a drop for you to be able to flip the switch and go completely remote um, it's just one of those things it's a moving target right it's like flying an airplane and trying to repair it and then, and then land it, but not having any, any direction of where to land it, and you're running out of fuel, and it's just a huge scenario. But, and I think going into the, um, you know, for the scenario, how we're preparing, I think, uh, like I mentioned, folks are looking to really use Google Classroom. They've done a lot of uh, PD. There's some stuff that's being handled by our IT folks, um, as well as some uh, digital professionals we tried to identify our kind of super users that are, you know, what we call digital leads um, that potentially can help our the rest of our staff if they're not as fluent um, in the technology just to get themselves up to speed. And I think it's really about doing some creativity. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to just mention real quick, when we came back, when we finally ended in June, 
you know, one of the things I know that wasn't mentioned on the list of questions, but it's important, is the whole um, focus of Career and Tech Ed was the whole credentialing piece, right? Is industry certifications and those. Um, so many of the students didn't have the opportunity to get those maybe in place by the end of the school year. I just want to give a good shout out to our program advisory committee members and our teachers who had some creative ideas in which our program advisory folks, you know, in industry, uh, and as we mentioned, our folks are from industry and they're our experts, but our program advisory folks opened up their own uh, uh, buildings in corporations and, and businesses to allow our students to potentially go in and take a welding test when the state hadn't opened up the school again to have the students be able to come back in. Uh, they opened it up, they had their protocols in place, um, and that was uh, a huge help. Some of the cosmetology salons, they were able to open, have our students get their final, you know, mock trials in to be able to take the state tests. Uh, so I think we rely on a larger group of individuals than just our school community, but also our business and industry, and of course our state folks as well. Uh, and any extra support from the state and federal government for funding is uh, very appreciated. Well, I am going to be adding some questions for our podcast that we're recording next week together um, to dig in a little bit deeper into that because that is, I'm glad you brought that up, that is such a big issue that we've heard over and over again is how do we get those seat hours in and that credentialing piece and those partnerships are, are truly key. And you were also talking some about the digital uh, side of it. So our next question is what's a digital tool that that each of you recommend to the folks who are listening? Um, we know that there's so, so much out there and sometimes that can be overwhelming. So what's something that you feel is just a game changer that has made an impact for you or for your teachers or students that you would like to share? And Aaron, can you kick off this question for us? I can. And one of the things that actually came to my mind was when I saw my daughter um, playing with it. She's a big Minecraft fan. And, and I say this because so many kids across the world love Minecraft. But if you put an educational spin on it, I think you're really going to get a lot of bang for the buck. And, and for an example, if I'm using architecture and I want to go over a certain aspect or competency within the architecture, I would have the students develop that based upon the criteria and really evaluate it based upon a rubric where we would do like a Zoom share screen and have some great discussions from that. I think another great tool that people could use that kind of thought about it is TikTok. And, and even though it's a one minute video, it's an opportunity for kids to reflect and share and burn some energy. And that's really one of the greatest ways that you find out how kids learn or what they didn't learn as a result of them sharing that information with you. So if, if I'm a cosmetologist and I want to learn how to put on foundation, then I would have them describe it as they're actually walking through it with a mannequin or with a peer, little sister, little brother. And I, I just think there's just great opportunities here that we can make learning fun again, which makes everybody win. So one of my favorites and uh, one of the favorites of uh, the staff here at Pathfinder is uh, Edpuzzle. I'm not sure if anybody has used Edpuzzle before. So with Edpuzzle, you can actually build informative assessments into videos that you can kind of get from, from the internet. So um, even our vocational technical teachers can find a video on some type of project that they're doing with their kids and build in informative assessments right into even that demonstration video for something uh, in a vocational setting versus just strictly academic. Uh, also something uh, Pear Deck, our students like Pear Deck, our teachers like Pear Deck, things like Mentimeter. I mean, there's a, there's a ton of things that you can find. Uh, Mentimeter is good for polling, polling your students and uh, you know, doing those quick formative checks. Um, a lot of the things that we, that we are looking at are things to make sure that checking for understanding is happening still virtually. Uh, you know, it's one of the biggest things that you can do um, during a lesson is checking for understanding constantly with the students. So any of these types of uh, virtual tools or digital tools that you can build in formative assessments into your lesson uh, versus just having a student do a reading, answer questions afterwards, post a reading, do questions afterwards, making things a little more interactive. And uh, like I said, there's a lot of tools out there. Pear Deck is one of the good ones, like I said, for um, you know, building those formatives into PowerPoints and Google Slides. It integrates into Google Slides and everything. Um, Camtasia or Screencastify is great, you know, so you can record uh, lessons 
and uh, you know send those lessons out to students so you can actually screencast what you're doing um, you know with projects that you're doing in a vocational setting as well as academic um, there's a lot of the old school Khan Academy and things like that too uh, everybody knows about but um, I'll let the others on the panel kind of give some um, you know there's, there's a lot that you can list off I think that's me again. <clears throat> so Dan took my thunder. I was going to say screencast-o-matic, which is similar to a throw a throw off of uh, uh, screencastify, uh, which you know a student could be doing a PowerPoint or something off a of Google Doc, and then they can either record themselves either in the in the corner or just have their voice over uh, while they're explaining what's happening uh, on the screen. Um, I think you know uh, even though it's free Google Docs, I think uh, or Google Classroom. Uh, that whole suite is something that I think students are learning to embrace a little bit better. I think, um, you know, it's it's a little bit, there's, there's a huge transition, especially, I don't know how it is with my colleagues across the country, but in career tech ed, we have, you know, our special populations, we tend to have anywhere between a 29 and 34% uh, percentage of our students that are requiring special needs uh, assistance. And, you know, some of the normal digital tools like a Google Classroom and such, uh, or sharing Google Docs, you know, some of the skill sets that they may have may need additional assistance, um, but Google seems to be working pretty well in which they can be sharing ideas. You can have one document up. Um, they can be doing a group type of uh, assignment or work. Um, it takes a little bit longer. Of course, you have some translator that's in there as well for those folks that are having EL issues, but, um, you know, I mean, for short, quick communications, we use a, uh, an app called the Remind app um, for teachers to stay in touch. It's a one-way type of communication. You know, I think it's really important to engage the students in the technology that they're used to. And it's not always a computer, but it has to be their, you know, mobile device. Uh, and, you know, some teachers do a better job at that than others. But, um, you know, it's, it's something that I think we're all going to now need to take a really good look at to potentially see um, what we normally would have banned in the classroom, you know, can be actually embraced and utilized uh, to benefit uh, student learning. I'll, I'll add to this list one that I've discovered this year, uh, which is VoiceThread. Um, and the reason I really like VoiceThread is because it uses video, but uh, we were talking about giving really precise feedback. It really allows um, you to make verbal comments on particular parts of a student's video. So if they videotape themselves doing something remotely, you can say at 20 seconds, give them a little bit of a comment on what they did. Um, you can also allow students to comment on each other's videos. And so one thing that's really nice about that is it really creates interaction amongst students who are learning remotely. It uses video platforms, but allows you to communicate about precise parts in the video, which I think is very helpful for students. So I'll give that little plug to VoiceThread because I think that's a really good tool. So I, <laughs> I would go off what everybody else says. I've heard all of those too. I would also say some of those things that seem maybe like they're lower tech, but they're still tech. Um, have I've kind of witnessed being the most impactful, just making Google Slides and having all the students have, you know, one slide, the second slide, you have the third slide, and just collaborating on that has, it was amazing. Um, just using Jamboard, because we use Google here, just to collaborate and kind of, um, they can use sticky notes and lines and things has really worked out for one of my teachers. And then one of my other programs did their CTSO officer elections using Flipgrid. So they all had to make a Flipgrid and they had to make a Google slide and embed their Flipgrid URL. And then off that entire um, Google slide presentation, all the students could watch it and then they voted on a Google form. So it might seem simplistic, but it really worked off and it went off well because I think of everything the panelists mentioned, it encouraged the most collaboration. Um, I'm also going to share in the chat, I wish I could take credit for this, but we have a curriculum consortium around the state of Arizona and they made an amazing digital tool PDF that aligned with um, what active participation strategy you want to use and what digital tool corresponds with that. So I'll put it in the chat right now. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. And this hour has gone by so fast. There were additional prompts, but we are going to save those for another time. Thank you to each of you for being a panelist today and for sharing so much richness and goodness that folks are going to be able to implement. And thanks for our participants for joining us. If you are interested in being on a future webinar or on our podcast, please email me at info at ncla-cte.org and enjoy the rest of your day.